In this third video of our series, I'll show you several ways to schedule and modify tasks in the Arduino using the Task Scheduler library and how to implement a delay between dispatch tasks. In this sketch, I've included the software serial library because I want the tasks to report their status on the monitor. I find this method of producing serial output convenient. The required template is in the example constants header file. Each of the scheduled task definitions or constructors takes three parameters, next, period, and function. Next specifies when in the future to dispatch function in milliseconds. The special case of zero means now or immediately. The special case of minus one means never. Period is the interval between dispatches of function. The special case of zero means dispatch function only once. Function is the function to be dispatched. The special case of null means do not dispatch. The function has not yet been provided. The convenient constants now, never, and one shot are defined in the library. These examples define scheduled tasks taking those three parameters I just described. Task 1 is an arbitrary but unique name you assign to the scheduled task object. In this case, we want do something to be dispatched immediately and every one second thereafter. This shows two equivalent ways of expressing this. Scheduled task, task 3, will dispatch do something in 50 milliseconds and every 1,000 milliseconds thereafter. Task 4 is never to be dispatched until its next value is changed in the sketch. Tasks 6 and 7 are one-shot tasks, meaning they are to be dispatched only once. Task 8 is a placeholder task. It will need to be altered within the sketch in order to be scheduled. The rest should be self-explanatory. These scheduled task definitions are constructed before setup runs, so in setup we can interrogate or alter them using member functions. Here's an example of obtaining the next time to dispatch for task 3. Here's how to alter the next time to dispatch task 3, and how to alter the period for task 3. This statement will fetch the next and period values for task 3 so that we can verify they changed. This statement will fetch the next and period values for task 8 which contains the special cases of never and one shot. This call to the member function setFunk will alter the function to be called by the dispatcher. This call to the member function getFunk allows us to verify that the new function got altered. Finally, here is how to obtain the number of scheduled tasks in the dispatcher's list. Now let's look at a couple of the tasks. I've split my editor screen so we can see the scheduled task definition at the same time as the task itself. My task will cause compute total to be dispatched seven seconds after startup and every two and a half seconds thereafter. When we look at the actual task, we see that it decrements a countdown to limit its dispatches. Note that when the run count goes to zero, it changes the next value to never preventing further dispatches. Scheduled task another will cause calculate to be dispatched at 15 seconds to run once. It alters the placeholder final such that it will cause task 4 to be dispatched in 1500 milliseconds. Now let's run the sketch and take a look at its output. If you look back over the code, you'll see that the output is as expected. Now let's look in more detail at how to pass an argument to a scheduled task. We've included the sched task t header file for that purpose. The definition of a scheduled task using sched task t takes the usual three arguments of next, period, and function, plus the parameter to be passed to the dispatch function. 
In C++ terms, SCED Task T is a template such that it can be tailored to construct a scheduled task object that can receive a parameter of a particular type. This is an example of passing the integer variable parm1 to the task. You can see up above that the value of parm1 is 9. We could have simply used the literal 9. Notice that we have to tell the compiler the type of the argument, in this case an int. Here we pass a reference to an int. If you're not familiar with references, don't worry about that for now. Here's how to pass a double and a string. The next one is a bit unusual. We're telling the dispatcher to pass a pointer to a sked task t object, and because the argument is ampersand task 5, that is the address of the task 5 object, that pointer is to this object. That could be handy when the dispatch task might be general enough that it doesn't know the name you assign to the scheduled task, but needs to access its member functions. Take a look at task 5 to see how that might work. Our sked task t object could of course point to any other sked task t object, perhaps in a chain defining a sequence of tasks. Next is an array of ints. This is a way to pass multiple integers. Finally, here is how to pass an array of sked task pointers. Our setup function initializes part of the scheduled task array. You may not need to pass many of these types, but I've included them here to make the more advanced users aware of them. In the previous example, we looked at the member functions available for the sked task object. Sked task t has two additional member functions that we can see in the unused task 9 here. They are used to fetch and set the parameter to be passed to the dispatch task. We're used to program flow continuing by having called functions return to their callers. However, we've seen that scheduled tasks do not return to their callers. They run at their scheduled times and effectively just exit. Furthermore, we know that we cannot use the built-in delay function within a scheduled task. In this example, I'll show you how to overcome these limitations using two methods. The first method uses one scheduled task to start the job which then schedules another task to continue it. In our example, start task gets dispatched as a one-shot task, and it then schedules the continue task one second later to continue its work. Chaining scheduled task this way requires a separate sked task definition for each segment of the job, which may be undesirable if there is a large number of them. So a second method reuses a single task definition. Here, start2 is dispatched to perform the first part of the job, and it not only schedules the next segment, but it overwrites its own definition to point to the function that is to continue the processing. This could be continued indefinitely. Here is what the monitor output looks like. Let's take a moment to review the guidelines for using the task scheduler. First, remember that scheduled tasks do not return to any user code, such as some function that scheduled them. In effect, they do their thing and terminate. Scheduled tasks must not tie up the processor, such that the dispatcher cannot dispatch another task that is due. This means no long computations and no use of the delay function in a scheduled task. By long computations, I mean a time that is long relative to the interval between required dispatches of any tasks in the sketch. Only the dispatcher should run in loop. You may need to make exceptions, but if you do, make sure any such code runs quickly. For maximum flexibility, scheduled tasks may schedule other tasks, including themselves. They can also modify any schedules, including their own. By modify, I mean alter the next dispatch time, the period, and or the function to be dispatched. 
In the case of sched task t, the argument may also be changed on the fly, but not the type of that argument. I hope you're finding these tutorial videos useful. If you care to make a small donation to my PayPal account, I'd really appreciate it. See the notes below. In the next video, I'll show you various methods of scheduling and modifying tasks and how to implement a delay between dispatch tasks.